Welcome to worship with St. Martin's United Church. We invite you to have a candle with you that you can light as we light our Christ candle. Hi folks, I want to let you know about an exciting new opportunity. A number of ministers from across Living Skies region of the United Church are going to be offering an online Bible study on Wednesday afternoons from 1 to 2 p.m. beginning on February 3rd. And this is a, a drop-in thing, so you can just attend the ones that work for you. You can go to our Facebook page or our website and find a link there to register, and then you will be sent the Zoom link for the Bible study. If you have any questions about that, just give me a call or send me an email and I'll help you get registered. Hope to see many of you there. Hi everyone. Children's Church is on Zoom at 11 a.m. today. You can email Jordan for the link. Hi. Do you miss chatting with people after church in the lounge? Then join us on Zoom for the next best thing. The community check-in happens at noon on Sundays and you can find the link for it in the church chat. Hope to see you there. Hi folks, I have two exciting things to tell you about. The first is that this year's United Church Lenten devotional is now available at the United Church Resource Distribution Center. It's called Faith on the Move. This is a book full of daily reflections and meditations to carry you all the way from Ash Wednesday through past Easter. So a wonderful companion for everyone for their Lenten journey, and it's not very expensive. You can order it through the United Church Resource Distribution Center at UCRD Store. Ca. Now, the other exciting thing I want to tell you about is this year, McClure and St. Martin's are going together to offer a Lenten study series, and we're going to be using this book as the basis for the study series, although you don't actually have to have a copy of the book in order to participate in the study. It would be helpful, but it's not necessary. So, Joint Lenten study series with McClure and St. Martin's beginning February 18th from 7 to 8 p.m. on Zoom. There will be information in the church chat and the messenger coming out soon. And there's already an event that gives you all the details on our Facebook page. So hope that many of you will choose to join the study series and that many of you will choose to order a copy of this book. Our territorial acknowledgement is an expression of gratitude and appreciation to those on whose territory we live and worship. We honor the Indigenous people who have been living and working on this land from time immemorial. We are mindful of our history and our responsibilities as treaty people as we seek to live together in a good way. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge our relationship with the Indigenous people of this land. We acknowledge, we acknowledge that we are gathering for worship on the traditional lands of the First Nations and the homeland of the Métis. We are all treaty people bound by the understandings made in the agreement known as Treaty 6. Good morning. My name is Keith Hall and I'm here with my ministry colleague Jordan Cantwell and our talented worship crew Ken Glover, Kathy and Bob Anderson and Betty Lou Agnew. Special thanks to Nick and Nicole Kenny for lighting the Christ candle, to Greg Bell for reading scripture, and to all who contributed announcements. We begin our worship by lighting the Christ candle. Nick and Nicole will lead us in our candle lighting, and we invite each of you to light a candle where you are. From this Christ light, we light our affirming and peace candles, shining a light on our commitment to building peace, justice, and a community where all may find belonging.
please join me in our responsive call to worship. Scripture reminds us that those who wait for God will renew their strength. And so, and so we, we have, have gathered, gathered today to, to wait, wait for God. God. To bring the living of our lives to be blessed. To, to find, find meaning and purpose for living every, every day. To renew our strength that we might serve God well and fully. In, in all the places, places life calls us to be. to be. Worship offers us the invitation to spend time with God in community. To, to experience, experience the still, small voice. And inspired by that voice. To, to find, find our, our way, way forward. forward. Come, let us worship God. pray with me. Every time we answer your call, O oh God, we meet you again as if for the first time. Each moment is a revelation. Each meeting leads to our hearts opening wider to you and to others. Each encounter shines light onto the strength of relationships fostered while following Jesus the Christ, the one who invites and equips the one who is companion and guide, the one who is giver and gift. We thank you for calling us and for empowering us to respond. In the name of the one we follow, we pray. Amen. Please join me as we say together responsively Psalm 62. For God alone my soul waits in silence. From God, God comes, comes my, my salvation. salvation. God alone is my rock and my salvation. My, my fortress, fortress, I shall, I shall never, never be shaken. shaken. How long will you assail a person? Will you will batter, batter your victims, victims all of you, as you would a leaning wall, a tottering fence? Their only plan is to bring down a person of prominence. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths. But inwardly they curse. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for, for my, my hope, hope is from God. God alone is my rock and my salvation. My, my fortress, fortress I, shall I shall not be shaken. shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My, my mighty, mighty rock, rock, my, my refuge, refuge is in God. God. Trust in God at all times, O people. Pour, Pour out your heart, heart before, before God, God, who is refuge for us. us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those, Those of high estate, estate are a delusion. delusion. 
In the balances, they go up. They are yeah. together yeah. lighter yeah. than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion. And set, and set no, no vain hopes, hopes on, on robbery. robbery. If, if riches, riches increase, increase, do, do not, not set, set your, your heart, heart on them. On them. Once God has spoken. Twice, Twice have I heard this. That power belongs to God. And, and steadfast, steadfast love, love belongs to you, O Lord, Lord. For you repay to all. According, according to, to their, their work. work. Today's scripture reading comes from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 to 20. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew, casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called to them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the testimony from our ancestors in faith. Thanks be to God. Friends, please pray with me. Holy One, may you be in the words of my mouth and in the meditations of all of our hearts and minds as we seek to hear and understand the word that you have for us this day. Amen. Well, I love this iconic story from Mark of Jesus calling the fishermen and they drop their nets and they follow Jesus. It's, it's an awesome story and quite compelling. But there's something about it that kind of bothers me. It seems implausible that these men would just drop everything, their livelihood, their nets, their boats, they leave their family and their community to follow this guy who just shows up on the beach one day and says, follow me? I mean, who does that? And while that's part of the mystery and, and what's so compelling about this story, it also makes it hard for me to imagine myself doing what they did because it just doesn't make a lot of sense. And so I've always figured there has to be more to this story. And of course there is. And the gospel itself uh, gives us evidence of that. We know that Jesus has come to the Galilee and he is preaching and teaching and, and proclaiming the, the gospel that, that 
the kingdom promised of God by the prophets is close at hand and he's inviting people to, to reorient their lives and, and to become part of this kingdom movement. So there's a really good chance that all of these fishermen, Simon and Andrew and James and John, have at the very least heard about Jesus because people would have been talking about this, this new guy who's come to town and, and what he's saying and doing. But there's a very real chance that they've also heard him themselves, that they have been amongst those crowds have, who have gone out to listen to him. And so they have some idea of what Jesus is about and, and what it is he's, he's proclaiming at any rate. But we know more than that as well because uh, biblical scholars have dug into the history of first century Palestine. And one of my favorite biblical scholars, who is also a friend of mine, Ched Myers, uh, has really focused his scholarship on the Gospel of Mark. And he tells us some very important things that have helped to illuminate uh, what's going on in this passage in a new way for me. So I want to share some of that wisdom with you. We know that at the beginning of the first century, Tiberius replaces Augustus as emperor of Rome. And Herod, King Herod, in an attempt to curry favor with the new emperor, uh, builds a, a new capital city for the region of Galilee, calling it Tiberius. Not very subtle. And the city of Tiberias is to be the new administrative and military center for the whole region. Now we know that all of these port cities and communities along the shores of the Sea of Galilee were mainly fishing villages, that fish was a staple of the local diet, and that many people made their living as subsistence fisher people and that this was a thriving part of the country. Well, this new city, Tiberias, as one of its key functions is to regulate the fishing industry around the Sea of Galilee and to bring it under Roman control and to have it serve Roman interests, which means that the fishing industry, which uh, up until now has, has been a, like a family fishing industry uh, that fed the local populace, is now going to be designed for export. That all the product is to be brought up and dried, salted, um, and shipped out to feed the uh, elites of Rome and the Herodians. That means that the local fisher, fisher people, uh, uh, their lives are completely changed. Uh, where they just fished um, before, they now have to purchase a lease from the Romans in order to be able to fish legally on the sea. And then their product is heavily, heavily taxed uh, which, and, and all taken for export which means that their way of life is completely disrupted, their diet is completely di disrupted, their income is disrupted, and these self-sufficient fisher people have, are cast into a, a system of poverty and exploitation and dependency. And there's a, a tremendous loss of both dignity and of hope for them in this. I just want to bracket a comment right here. When I was a moderator and have the privilege of traveling across this country, I saw a very similar reality when I was in British Columbia. Um, up the, the British Columbia coast, the fishing industry had gone through a very similar transformation there, where local fisher people who had just lived off of the produce of the sea for thousands of years, um, when when government and corporations came in and uh, corporatized and industrialized the fishing industry, um, their subsistence fishing disappeared and they then had to, if they wanted to continue to make a livelihood, had to become part of this industrialized fishing uh, project where again, 
um, things were being canned and sent for export. So a very real story that has resonance with the Canadian experience and I suspect that there are many Saskatchewan farmers who could tell a similar tale of how industrialization and corporatization of the farming industry has pushed many farmers um, either out of business or forced them into uh, uh, no longer subsistence farming where they can feed their family this way but but forced them into a, a much more challenging and less profitable um, higher risk way of farming. End of bracket. I want to go back now to first century Palestine uh, and continue the, the understanding of what was happening there in Jesus' day. So we, we have Simon and Andrew and James and John, uh, two families of fisher people who have probably heard about Jesus, maybe heard him preaching about God's kingdom, how he's calling folks to a new way of life, and then he shows up on the shore and he says, follow me and I will make you fish for people. Now, what we hear in this fish for people, and how that's often been interpreted for us, is that you will become those who go out and, and bring people to Jesus, savers of souls. That's what it means to fish for people. and You're going to catch people and bring them to Jesus. That's what we hear. But what they would have heard was quite different. They would have heard an echo of the Hebrew prophets. In four separate places from four different Hebrew prophets, we hear this language of fishing for people. The first place is in Jeremiah. And the context there is that God says that God is going to send fishermen to catch wayward people. And those wayward people are the ones who have polluted the land with idols. And so these fishermen are going to catch and remove those folks who have polluted the land with idols. The second time is in the book of Amos. And Amos, the comments are targeting the elites of Israel who are oppressing the people. And Amos says that God is going to send people to take those those elites away with fish hooks. Gonna fish them on out of there. Ezekiel refer, is referring to Pharaoh's claim that Egypt and Pharaoh owns the Nile River and all the produce therein. And in response to that, God vows to put hooks in Pharaoh's jaws and draw him up out of the river along with all the other fish and toss them out into the wilderness. That's what Ezekiel talks about, fishing for people. It's fishing out the imperial power who, cl un who claims authority and ownership over the waterways that are God's and fishes them right on out of there. And then Habakkuk. Habakkuk speaks about how the enemy destroys the people by making his nets into a god and using them to empty the seas to make himself rich, showing no mercy to the nations who are like fish caught in his nets. When Jesus uses the language, I will make you fish for people, he's evoking these prophetic witnesses which serve as a warning to oppressors and that echo the laments of the oppressed and particularly resonate with those who are being oppressed by the privatization of the Sea of Galilee's commonwealth. His words are a summons to the marginalized workers to join him in a movement that will restore God's justice and return dignity to the poor. With that background, it's easy to see how the fishermen would hear Jesus' invitation as good news and would immediately drop everything and join him. It still took incredible courage, incredible risk and commitment. 
to make that decision, to drop everything. Because it, it, it meant not just leaving their livelihoods behind, it meant leaving their families behind, their communities. It, it ruptured their lives both economically and socially. To have heeded that call from Jesus required wholehearted commitment. Those first disciples had to be all in. There was, there was no sort of one foot in, one foot out. It was an uncompromising break with business as usual. One more tidbit from Ched. He lifts out that Greek word aphiemi, which uh, is the one that is translated as to leave or to let go. They, they left their nets, they left their boats, they, they left their father. That verb, to leave or to let go or to, to let loose, is used elsewhere in the Gospels, and particularly in Mark's Gospel, to mean forgiveness. Forgiveness of debt, forgiveness of sin, and liberation from bondage. A loosing, a releasing, a letting go of that which holds us bound. So they leave their bondage to a system that oppresses them, and they risk everything to follow this invitation to participate in a project of restoration, liberation, and wholeness. Fishing for people is an invitation to root out the foundations of systemic oppression. It's an invitation to topple the idols of self-serving economics, racial superiority, and environmental ex exploitation that was just as rampant in the first century as it is in the 21st century. It's an invitation to look at how we have become stuck in systems and ways of being that no longer bring life, that undermine human dignity, and erode well-being. It's an invitation that resonates for us today as well. Jesus is still coming to the shorelines of our lives and inviting us to follow him, to follow him in a movement of becoming fishers for people, to do this rooting out of injustice, to notice the, the systems of bondage and oppression and how they operate and how we're caught in them, and to let them go, to be released and liberated from our bondage to them and freed up to live lives of dignity and to ensure that everyone else gets to live a life of dignity. That is the movement to which those first disciples were called and to which we are called. I think that that, that call speaks volumes to our culture and our priorities today. It speaks to the injustices and the imbalances in our society that have become even more evident during this pandemic. It also speaks to our church. It's an invitation for us to look closely at, at our own ways of doing things, our own assumptions about how to be church and why to be church. To look closely to see what might need to be let go. What's, what attachments are actually holding us back from really embodying the gospel, the good news of liberation, of dignity, of wholeness and life abundant for all. It's in that letting go that our hands and our lives are freed up to embrace the gospel more fully, to have a more expansive vision. That is the invitation. 
It's not an easy one to say yes to, despite how easily it appears that the first disciples just dropped everything and followed him. They had so little to lose, and they were aware of it. May God give us eyes and hearts and minds to see those places where we are held captive to old ideas, to old ways of thinking and being, to systems that serve to oppress rather than lift up all peoples. May we recognize that bondage and in recognizing that, find it a welcome invitation to leave that behind, to root it out, to fish it out of the waters of our lives, to become enthusiastic, wholehearted, two feet in members of the Jesus movement of life abundant for all. Amen.
Will you pray with me? Our gracious, eternal God, we thank you that Jesus' call to his disciples came in such an uneventful way. Contrary to the wisdom of the world, he did not start with the privileged and the wealthy and the powerful. He did not begin with those who had little need and little desire for change. He began with some very ordinary folks. He began with fishermen. We pray that his call, come follow me, might again reverberate through our souls today. May we hear again the challenge to be your disciples. May we hear again the message of this one who brings us good news. May we hear again the invitation to come to you, all you who are weary and heavy laden. May we hear again eternal words of hope, which tells us that however dark the world becomes, the darkness cannot ever overcome the radiant light of this Holy One, Jesus. May we hear again those simple words, come follow me, and may we come just as we are and know again the depth of your grace and love for us. God, although we long to forget much of what is happening currently in the world, we lift up all of what we feel in our bodies to you, our sadness, our anger, our helplessness, our confusion, our disgust, our desire to change ourselves and those around us, our longing to move on, our wish for hope. All of these feelings and many others we lift up to you and we ask that you take them as we also continue to work through them ourselves. We pray that we and those around us may be understanding as we each do this work at different times and in different ways. We ask that you help us to find a way to sit with our emotions while also sitting with you. Although we often want to separate ourselves from the actions of others, we ask that you forgive us and guide us to check ourselves for the hatred, the racism, the bigotry, and the lack of love that we reveal in ways that we do not even realize or that we choose to ignore. Guide us, God, and deepen our hearts that we might comprehend that no matter how good we think we are, we need to ensure that we are embodying your love in every action and word. Healing God, we pray for all in our community and in our church family who seek your presence and have asked for our prayers. Help us to offer our personal prayers for each person as their names are read. We particularly remember today, Bob and Betty Lou, Mary, Diane, Troy, Lorna, Aaron, Peggy, Gord, Jane, and family, Leanne and family, Lillian, Eunice, Lorna, Amy, Jenny, Roy and Janet, the family and friends of Kay Nicklin, the family and friends of Jim Holt Slander, the family and friends of Joan Cosgrove. O oh God, we pray for those whom we name before you now in the silence of our hearts. God, we ask for your presence as the world continues to experience the ravages of the COVID-19. We pray for the places all around the world where the numbers of positive test results continue to climb and as lockdowns continue to grow longer. We pray for all those in our local and in our church community affected by COVID-19, those who are ill, those who are grieving a loss, those who are anxious, isolated, and alone. We pray for those healthcare workers responding to and caring for our health needs. Finally, God, give us the power to bring change and transformation to the peoples of the world, as did those early fishermen. Give us the power to provide the same kind of hope for the world weary as they brought to theirs. Give us the vision of a world transformed and let us join together as we speak the prayer of Jesus together, saying, Our, our, mother, our mother and our, our Father, Father, which, which art, art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Everyone needs to know that somebody believes in them. The mission and service of the United Church of Canada lets people like Arwa Nofel know that you believe that they can change their lives for the better. My name is Arwa Nofel. Uh, I am from Palestine. Um, I am a mother of three beautiful children. I came here in summer uh, 2017 to Canada. It wasn't easy uh, for me at all as a single mom with the three kids in a new country, new culture, and new people. I was struggling. The whole family got involved to uh, Montreal City Mission with uh, all activities and projects they provided. Through Montreal City Mission, Arwa began a women's catering cooperative. It was uh, pretty good for me and for other women, other uh, refugee and newcomer women. It it went uh, bigger and bigger. Uh, until the pandemic hit. Arwa and her friends began sewing face masks for homeless shelters and frontline workers. The six women were soon producing more than 500 masks per week. I would like to thank Mission and Service of uh, United Church of Canada. But three years ago, I was just, uh, just a refugee woman who was in need, and now uh, I am a coordinator uh, of uh, so many activities uh, at Montreal City Mission. Actually, I consider myself a lucky person. I hope to see more and more women getting that chance to have this better life for their families. Oh, 
to follow Christ and to lead change in this community and this world, to accept Christ's protection and to offer protection to others. Let us go from here to live out good news with God's tender blessing.